Thank you for inviting me to come and speak with you tonight. Um, I'm really excited to share some of our work uh, and uh, some of what's known about uh, bacteriophages and their role in human health uh, and disease. So just to share my screen. So people are obviously concerned uh, about the world getting overpopulated, uh, but the truth of the matter is we are never uh, ever going to approach anywhere near the number of bacteria that we share the planet with. Um, and for that matter, uh, we won't uh, ever get anywhere even close to the number of bacteriophages. Uh, these are viruses that parasitize bacteria, uh, and they outnumber bacteria uh, by some estimates of over 1,000 or even 10,000 uh, to one. Um, and it's not just the planet. The human body actually has some similar numbers. Uh, so right now, um, as you sit there and watch this, this program, uh, you have something on the order of 10 to the 13 cells that together comprise your body, but you have even more bacteria. That may not be a surprise, but the bacteria, again, just like the planet, are far outnumbered by the bacteriophages uh, that you have living there with you. So what are bacteriophages? Well, uh, the name means bacteria eaters, and they are viruses, as I mentioned, that parasitize bacteria. They're highly specific to the strains uh, that they infect, um, and they're very abundant. Every time one of them uh, destroys a bacteria, it liberates anywhere from uh, 10 to several thousands of different um, progeny bacteriophages. And what's going to be important uh, to know about how these viruses work uh, is that they have two basically different ways of replicating. Um, the main way, and for those of you who may be familiar with bacteriophages, that you might think about is the lytic cycle. And what happens here is that just like the viruses that you and I might have, say, for example, influenza or COVID, uh, these viruses come and recognize their host cells. Um, they inject their DNA, they make new phages, and then they lyse um, the bacterial host and release their progeny to start the life cycle again. All of that sounds pretty familiar. Uh, to anyone who's ever gotten sick with a regular virus. Um, but what phages can do that most viruses that we have can't is that they can become lysogenic. And what happens here is they'll actually come in and infect the bacterial host, but then lie dormant within the bacterial genome. And when that bacterial genome uh, or bacteria comes under stress uh, or when the timing is just right, uh, they will replicate with the bacteria, but then lice uh, and enter into the lytic cycle. And so some bacteria only are lytic and they're purely you know, pathogens or, or parasites, but lysogenic bacteriophages uh, do some other interesting things. They can transmit antibiotic resistance um, and they have very complex relationships um, with their host bacteria. And that becomes important because our story tonight really has two halves. Um, and the first one is, is about those lytic bacteriophages and how we can use them potentially to protect us from uh, bacterial infections. But on the other hand, uh, what we're finding is that some lysogenic phages are out there that can actually drive disease. And these are the two stories that I'm gonna be telling you about this evening. Both stories uh, are going to involve uh, one primary species of bacteria that we study in my lab called Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And uh, it causes skin and lung infections. Uh, and it's quite a major source of both um, disease and uh, death and, and suffering around the world. Um, to the point where the World Health Organization has deemed this uh, one of the top critical priority pathogens uh, that you know, human governments and society need to concern themselves with. And PA01 is the name of the lab strain of Pseudomonas that I'm going to be mentioning uh, at several points during our discussion today. And Pseudomonas is problematic in part because it causes biofilms. And I'll tell you more about these in a moment. But essentially, uh, these are slimy, thick layers of bacteria and the polymers that they produce and anyone who's ever had a, a thick pneumonia and has coughed up um, sputum that looks anything like this has experienced biofilms. But biofilms are also in places like urinary tract infections or foot ulcers, as you see here on the other side. And what they do is they allow bacteria to colonize surfaces like wounds and airways, 
and they allow the bacteria to adhere to those surfaces and evade the immune system. Antibiotics also have a terribly difficult time penetrating through these surfaces, and that's why Pseudomonas is so problematic, because it becomes so very antibiotic resistant. And uh, so let's talk about lytic bacteriophages. And here is an example of, of a lytic bacteriophage called uh, OMKO1 or OMCO. Uh, and you can see that it's got a uh, sort of lunar lander-like shape uh, called the tail and, and capsid structure. Uh, and this is what latches onto the bacteria and causes uh, the infectious cycle to begin. And these were initially discovered uh, by Felix de Harel in 1917. And what he had done is he was culturing bacteria and he noticed that there were these holes that appeared in the lawn of bacteria in the Petri dish that he was looking at. And he didn't know what these were, uh, but he cloned the term bacteriophages. And he clearly recognized from the get-go the potential utility of these phages in fighting bacteria. You know, you have to remember that uh, as early as, you know, maybe a few decades before him, uh, people didn't know anything about bacteriophages or viruses. And so all of this was, you know, being discovered in tremendous leaps and bounds. But Durrell realized that we could use bacteriophages to fight infections, and so he did so. The first patients to receive bacteriophages to treat infections uh, were a set of four uh, uh, pediatric cases with uh, the bacterial diarrhea, which he treated in Paris to great success. Um, they then went and did the first clinical trial of phage therapy uh, in 1931. And you can see the actual data from the trial here on the side, um, where what you see represented are patients who recovered as open squares and patients who passed away as squares with lines through them. And you can also see the patients who received phage therapy as the ones with a dot. Uh, so, you know, these represent individual people who received phage therapy against cholera. And what you can see is as soon as they started initiating phage therapy, um, the lines through these boxes begin to disappear until the epidemic of, of cholera finally uh, goes away. And so in all, uh, 73 subjects received phage therapy and there were 118 controls and they witnessed about a 90% decrease in mortality. This was incredibly exciting at the time because you have to realize there were no antibiotics and no way to treat most bacterial infections. And so, of course, de Harel tried to commercialize this and turn it into genuine therapies, but the results were inconsistent. They didn't have very good methods of culturing bacteria. And to be honest, you know, they couldn't even visualize or understand what the organism was that they were dealing with. It wasn't until later that it became clear that it was virus. The biology of phages is complicated. And what this ended up contributing to is a number of business failures uh, by Durrell and others. But what really did phage therapy in uh, was the competition from pharmaceutical antibiotics, because around the same time that Durrell started working, the first antibiotics came about primarily through the German dye industry, and then ultimately things like penicillin uh, that came around later. And these were much easier to manufacture and a lot more reliable. And so for over 50 years, uh, the world forgot about phage therapy. It sort of languished on the sidelines, um, kept you know alive essentially by uh, places in the Soviet Union and in Eastern Europe where there wasn't a pharmaceutical industry and people still needed bacteriophages for different things. But unfortunately, what's happened in the rest of the world, and, and I would actually say the whole world, uh, is antibiotic resistance. And this, as you guys may know, is a widespread and growing problem. So it's currently estimated that over 700,000 people die globally from antibiotic-resistant infections, uh, and there's a tremendous economic cost associated with this. And the problem is, is that these antibiotic-resistant strains are spreading. Uh, and so now uh, the current thinking is that by 2050, over 10 million people a year will be dying from drug-resistant infections unless we're able to sharply change the trajectory of these infections. And so this begs the question, is there a role again for phage therapy? And phage therapy has a couple of advantages or several advantages that I think bring it to the fore in these cases. Um, one is that phages are self-amplifying. If you can get some phages to the site of infection, they'll make baby phages and so on and so forth. And very quickly, 
uh, you can outnumber the bacteria and get a control of the infection. That's at least the hope. They're also incredibly specific for the strains of bacteria that make them. And that's attractive uh, maybe to anyone who's ever taken antibiotics and gotten diarrhea or a urinary tract infection, because the antibiotics tend to kill all sorts of bacteria, not just the ones that are causing the problems. Um, bacteriophages are effective against biofilms like this, the sputum or that wound that I showed you, whereas conventional antibiotics have trouble getting through. Uh, phages have low toxicity. And finally, they're inexpensive. This could be a solution that could help a lot of folks around the world um, where access to drugs and conventional antibiotics in particular is limited. However, phage therapy has some disadvantages too. That narrow host range means that you have to hit the organisms that you're targeting exquisitely uh, uh, on, on the head, meaning you know, if you're targeting Staph aureus, but the wrong strain with your phages, uh, this therapy is not going to work. Um, phages are viruses, they're not drugs. And so unlike the conventional antibiotics that you can just take off the shelf and give to someone, um, these require a bit more work and the field is still figuring out how to make and store phages. And until we do, it becomes difficult to turn these into, you know, really effective uh, drugs for mainstream use. Um, Phage titers, uh, unfortunately, when you leave these things on the shelf, fall off, and so that becomes a concern. Um, and the purity of these things has to be, and you know, something that folks need to pay attention to. There can't be a lot of bacterial crud uh, in these preparations, or else people are just going to get sick. And you know, the other thing about it is, uh, unlike conventional antibiotics, where pharmaceutical companies have invested lots of time and money and energy in working out exactly how to dose these things, you know, three times a day, four times a day, two weeks versus five weeks, these kinds of things, those literature, you know, are basically missing from the phage therapy field. And until we do those studies, uh, we just don't know uh, for most of these things how to deliver them. Um, phage therapy in the U.S. Uh, got a real kick in the pants uh, in 2017 when the first patient uh, to be treated uh, in many, many years in the U.S. Um, was Tom Patterson. And he um, had developed a uh, multidrug resistant infection with um, a gram-negative bacterium that was causing pancreatitis, and he was critically ill in the intensive care unit. Um, he received phages from Texas A&M University uh, and in association with a company called Amplify, uh, and he improved almost immediately. And this was exciting for a couple of reasons. First, uh, again, it was the first case of phage therapy and, and certainly the first successful one in many, many decades uh, in the U.S., but then the other thing that this did is his wife, Stephanie Strathty, who you see here, uh, ended up writing a book about this called The Perfect Predator. And this, I think, caught the imagination and attention of many people, not just in the U.S., but all around the world and in Western Europe, um, and started sort of a resurgence in phage therapy. And so uh, at the University of San Diego, where Stephanie is, is based, um, they started a center for innovative phage applications and therapeutics. Um, and now there's there's probably about six or seven centers that I know of in the country um, that are spearheading these efforts to develop phage therapy. Um, there have been a lot of case reports. Uh, this is a study out of my lab uh, where we just went through the literature essentially and enumerated the different case reports of successful phage therapy. This is a couple of years old now um, from 2020. There have been a bunch more. Um, but you can see a lot of these uh, strategies target antimicrobial resistant bugs like Pseudomonas aeruginosa that I showed you earlier, uh, but then also other organisms as well. Um, and, uh, you know, these are generally speaking successful cases, probably the ones that don't work, you don't end up hearing about as much. Um, and that's a real problem. Um, because really what you need are clinical trials. You need studies where people go and rigorously, you know, give phage therapy, but also give placebos and then monitor the results and report honestly and, you know, overtly about what uh, these found. And there really are not very many clinical trials that have been done. And almost all of the ones that exist out there are phase one trials, um, which is to say they look at, at safety um, rather than efficacy. There are very few 
uh, stage one, two trials even. Uh, these tend to be trials where they consider efficacy, but they're not really powered to look for these results. Um, and there are no stage three clinical trials uh, and no clinical products. And so even though phage therapy has been approved in the US um, for food, um, and is being used in different settings uh, in agriculture. In humans, there are no approved phage therapy products uh, for use, and, and that goes for either the EU or the United States. Um, but what the other thing that's happening, in addition to uh, these phage therapy institutes and people, you know, really getting their rolling up their sleeves and getting to work on trying to use phage therapy in patients, is that there have been a, a number of different companies now uh, that have been launched to try to develop phage therapy uh, as commercial products. And so uh, the last time I looked, this, you know, the, the slide is probably about a year old now. Um, there were 28 such companies uh, here in the U.S. Um, and many uh, of these companies are funding their own clinical trials, which is exactly what we need. And what's happening is the refining of a whole system for identifying storage and transporting portation of phage therapies. The other thing that's going on is that folks are starting to use uh, technologies that Durrell Dihurel didn't have in his day. So everything from characterizing the genomes of bacteriophages to engineering them to be better at what they do. Uh, and so folks are using things like CRISPR, uh, CAS editing, to take lysogenic phages and turn them into lytic phages, um, or to expand the host range of different phages and to make them work better uh, with antibiotics. And this is an incredibly powerful approach um, that you know, also helps to open up the intellectual property in this space. Because you could see where if you're a company, uh, you know, rather than harnessing natural products that are out there in the world and are difficult to patent, you can actually take a phage make it better and now get intellectual property on that in ways that allow you to turn out a commercial product. And so that's exciting uh, ultimately for a lot of reasons. Um, and these engineered bacteriophages have been shown to work uh, and to help folks. Um, so it's not just in vitro. Uh, this is a case from a 15-year-old uh, girl uh, who had cystic fibrosis, which is a genetic lung disease. And she was infected with a bacterium, uh, mycobacterium abscessus, for over eight years and ended up um, having a lung transplant because of the severity of her disease. And the problem was that she couldn't get any more antibiotics uh, because the antibiotics were, were too toxic. And so she was treated with a cocktail of phage therapy. And she did great. Not only did the phages take care of the um, uh, bacteria in her lung, uh, but they got rid of the bacteria elsewhere in her body. And you can see sort of these black lesions here um, uh, ended up going away. And that was incredibly exciting and an inspiration for the field. Um, the other thing that's going on, in addition to engineering phage therapy, uh, is that uh, computational genomics are coming in and telling us how to do that better. So you can actually use uh, computational-based approaches to figure out which phages are going to work best against your bacteria and to help you design uh, your phages to do their job ever better. Um, the other thing that's going on is using phages plus conventional antibiotics to achieve synergies. And there are a number of cases like this um, where folks have used uh, salvage antibiotics to, to treat different cases. Um, this was a case that we were involved in uh, where uh, one of the fellows from our lab, who's now at Mayo Clinic, um, identified a patient with a chronic uh, Klebsiella pneumoniae infection um, who had received you know, all of these different treatments and replacements for joints uh, and antibiotic spacers all to no, no avail. Um, but Gina treated uh, this patient with phages that targeted Klebsiella specifically and was able to uh, not only get this patient better, but also to salvage his artificial knee. And uh, this person, it's now been a year or two uh, and they're doing great. And so this was, you know, for our lab at least, we were involved in a bunch of the bacteriology with this case. Gina was the person who actually treated the patient. Um, this, uh, I think, inspired us to do a lot more work uh, in this area. And so one of the things that, that we've been working on a bunch, uh, this isn't one of our papers, this is again another group, um, but is this concept of synergizing uh, antibiotic activity with phage activity. Um, and I think this approach is going to open up um, uh, additional frontiers and make phage therapy possible in other contexts, including in clinical trials, where you would have difficulty 
in uh, just treating with phages and not using antibiotics from a regulatory and um, economic perspective. So uh, all of these things are, are, are neat um, and uh, have potential. Um, the other thing that has been opening up new arenas, uh, I showed you OMK01 at the beginning of this part of the talk. And what's exciting about that phage is it actually targets uh, an antibiotic efflux pump that would otherwise take um, aminoglycosides and squirt them out of the bacteria. It's how the bacteria defends itself from this antibiotic. But because OMK01 targets that efflux pump, you present the bacteria with this terrible choice where it can either become resistant to the phage or become resistant to the antibiotic. Um, but one way or the other, uh, it's going to get squished. And these sorts of intelligent strategic uh, targeting of antibiotic resistance mechanisms, I think, again, introduces you know, novel tools and, and approaches into this, this old uh, technology. We've also, from an immunologic perspective, figured out that phages can actually partner with the immune system. Um, and that you can use uh, phages to, to um, uh, in conjunction with other therapies to get these to, to work. Um, uh, this particular uh, case was more about sublethal doses, but the idea is that you're sensitizing um, the bacteria to, to uh, both the host immune system as well as to the antibiotics. So where is phage therapy going and what do we need to do? Uh, and I think most of us in the field would agree that we need more rigorous methodology. We need to pick our phages better. Uh, we need to work out formulations. We need to test them for stability. And more than anything, we need rigorous basic science to help us you know, do all of these approaches better. Um, I think currently what's been working the best are personalized individualized therapy. So this sort of artisanal bespoke approach is unfortunately where we are until we can really work out how to make better cocktails and develop better approaches. Um, but to do those things, we're going to need government involvement. Um, and so in the same way that a lot of novel antibiotic um, development is being supported currently by our government and is a, you know, uh, and should be a high priority, uh, I think phage therapy there too is going to need help from uh, government involvement to make these approaches more affordable and to help the companies that are trying to work in this space to get started and develop clinical trials, just because trials are so large and, and expensive that it becomes difficult um, for a new company to do that on their own. And then finally, we need those trials. We need rigorous multicenter, uh, well-controlled phage three uh, clinical trials to, I think, unlock this potential. Um, so that's what I would offer uh, about phage therapy. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic that it's going to succeed. Um, but the other part of this is understanding phage biology in general. And I mentioned at the beginning of this talk uh, that there are both lytic phages that are you know, purely predators of bacteria, but then also lysogenic phages um, that can colonize the bacteria that produce them and help them cause disease. And if that sounds like a strange concept, you have to keep in mind that in your own body, you have bacteria that in some cases cause disease, and then you have other ones um, where the relationship is much more ambiguous. You know, bacteria help you digest your food. They actually keep you from getting some urinary tract infections and other diseases. Um, and they're important uh, components of human health, even though the same bacteria can make you sick. And so microbiology is, of course, full of these kinds of ambiguities. Um, and I think lysogenic phages offer some, some neat examples and lessons um, for how we relate to our microbiome. Now, the phage that I'm going to be telling you about um, with uh, these lysogenic phages, um, uh, the example is this phage called PF. And you'll notice that it looks very different from OMK01. Rather than that kind of lunar lander phages, these phages are long and thin. Uh, they have a completely different shape. And rather than blowing up the bacteria that produce them, these phages actually bud out of the surface of the bacteria and uh, don't actually destroy their bacterial host. Instead, they're integrated into the genome and their production is partly under the control of the bacteria that make them. So from an evolutionary point of view, some point in the distant past, you had a phage, a virus that infected its bacterial host, and then the bacteria figured out how to use this, uh, as I'm gonna show you, to do some nefarious things. And I'm going to tell you uh, two quick stories. Uh, the first is how this filamentous phage contributes to bacterial biofilm formation. I mentioned that that's a big way that a bacteria like Pseudomonas cause disease and how that contributes to antibiotic tolerance. 
And then if we have time, I'm going to tell you about a vaccine that my lab is developing to help target these phages to prevent pseudomonas infections. So as I mentioned earlier, these are biofilms, um, and these are important not only in sputum and lung infections and in wounds, but in many other contexts where pseudomonas causes disease. And if the concept of biofilms uh, is unfamiliar and maybe unintuitive, um, I would offer dental plaque as a terrific example of a biofilm that we're probably all familiar with. And what dental plaque is, and for that matter, what other biofilms are, are communities of bacteria, that's what this kind of round thing here is, surrounded by polymers that they produce and use to colonize different surfaces. And so the metaphor that I like uh, to think about in terms of what a biofilm is, is that it's a little bit analogous to an anthill or maybe a termite mound, where, you know, the unit of organism on some level, isn't actually the termite. You know, you could take your shoe off and smush this termite, but unless you actually get your shovel out and dig out that entire termite mound, you're not going to solve the problem of termites in your basement. Um, you know, in a way, the organism is, is the termites in the aggregate, but then also the mound that they live in. And similarly, plaque on your teeth, even if you got rid of one or, or two or most of the bacteria, if you didn't actually get rid of the whole biofilm by brushing your teeth, uh, and by flossing, you're not going to take care of the problem. And it turns out that biofilms like dental plaque, but you know, different organisms, uh, cause a lot of the chronic infections and even some of the relatively acute ones uh, that you, you know, think about and, and maybe even worry about. So things like urinary tract infections are actually layers of biofilm that cover the inside of people's bladders. Heart valve infections or biofilms uh, in the heart valve, um, but there's other catheter-related infections and you know lung infections and contact lens infections, and for all of these things we have to take long courses of antibiotics again because the antibiotics don't get through the biofilms very well, and so the question we've been asking in my lab is how does Pseudomonas assemble biofilms, and so uh, Pat Secor was a collaborator of mine. We were both postdocs uh, at the University of Washington. And uh, Pat came and showed me these data, I guess at this point, almost a decade ago, where what he saw was that when you take a polymer, which is a long carbohydrate, um, uh, for example, in your sputum, uh, this polymer is called hyaluronin. And when Pat took this polymer and added it to pseudomonas cultures, uh, I forget why he did this now, but what he saw were these crazy structures that, that formed. And if he treated these with an enzyme that breaks down the polymer into tiny little sugars, um, those structures went away. And we thought this was really cool because it suggested to us, we weren't thinking about phages, but we thought that maybe Pseudomonas was able to grab stuff in its environment um, and organize it into a biofilm. And that we thought that was kind of a neat idea. And it turns out you didn't need the Pseudomonas. You could just take the supernatant from these cultures and mix it with a polymer. And you got this film that just went wumpf and would stick to different surfaces. And so what you're looking at here is a little piece of glass um, on the bottom of a Petri dish where Pat added the polymer solution plus some phages. And what you see here is this thin film that just coats the entire slide. And so Pat took a pipette tip, kind of like a nail, if you will, and ran it through here and created this line. And you can sort of see this fractured surface. And so basically these phages are organizing the polymers in ways that create a film. And we figured out that it was this phage here, PF, that I already introduced you to. And really any polymer that you mix PF with uh, makes different films. So collagen is a polymer that's present in your skin. It's at different sites. And if you mix um, this phage with collagen, you get structures like this. If you mix the phage with DNA, you get structures like this. If you mix it with serum or urine, you get structures like this. It basically organizes, self-assembles, if you will, any polymer into this ordered structure. So what's going on here and, and does it matter? Well. What we saw was that if you take a solution of alginate, which is a polymer that bacteria make, and you take a drop of this phage and add it right here, um, it sort of crawls over and almost immediately organizes the entire slide into this, this crazy looking structure. And I'm a real science fiction geek. And what this reminded me of uh, was a book I read when I was a teenager called Cat's Cradle uh, by Kurt Vonnegut, 
where there's a molecule called ice nine, which is a crystal. And anything that ice nine touches turns into more ice nine because crystals have this very favorable state of entropy. And of course, the whole world wants to, anybody who's, who's ever watched their, their kids sit in front of the TV for like an entire evening knows that the world wants to sort of stay at a low state of entropy um, and really, you know, be relaxed and, and not move much. And so what happens in this book is that, you know, other things touch ice nine. And by the end of the book, the whole world has turned into one giant molecule of ice nine. The book's sort of a metaphor about the Cold War and, you know, mutually assured destruction. Um, but the point is that crystals organize uh, um, substrate into more crystal. And when we saw these images, this is what it reminded me of. And we asked the question, are these phage organized structures uh, crystalline? And so one property of crystals is that they polarize light. Um, and that is to say that it's a lattice-like network of molecules that lets um, that essentially divides light into, um, uh, well, what you see here in terms of birefringence. And so what we did is we looked at alginate, which is a polymer, again, that Pseudomonas produces. We looked at this phage, which is called PF4 in this iteration. And then when we mixed the two, we saw that that was all of a sudden birefringent. And if you remember your, your high school physics class, you probably saw phase change diagrams like this one, where with changes in temperature, you can shift from being water into ice. You can go from being a liquid into a crystal. And similarly, if we take concentrations of alginate in this phage, there's a tipping point where these turn from a liquid into a, a birefringent crystal, and we can measure that. And we can also change it with temperature and pH and, and other variables. But this is kind of cool because it suggested to us that this phage uh, assembles structures that have the properties of liquid crystals. And it's not just solutions of polymer. You can actually take the bacteria themselves. And we find that bacteria like uh, Pseudomonas that make small colony variants, which are these um, robust biofilm producing bacteria, are actually birefringent. They polarize light. Whereas rough colony variants that don't make uh, particularly robust uh, biofilms um, do not. And I think nobody's ever looked at this. We, we find actually that E. coli and Klebsiella and many of the other bacteria that are medically important and live in your body actually have phages just like this one and also make biofilms that are birefringent just like this one here. Um, and what we think is actually going on is that these phages are highly anionic. They have a negative charge. And if they're free to rotate in space along with solutions of polymers, um, in the same way that if you and I were to take two magnets and try to push them together, if the polarity matched or if the charges uh, were, were aligned, um, we would actually sort of push against each other and they would repel. And similarly, uh, if you stack the polymers and the phages dense enough, the polymers will actually repel uh, the phages, and these things will self-assemble into a crystalline network, uh, so long as they have what we call bridging cations to kind of mask these charges and allow them to uh, assemble densely. And so this is what this actually looks like. This is taking a drop of this phage and adding it to a solution of hyaluronin, uh, and you're looking at three minutes of footage. So that's pretty cool. Um, I never get tired of looking at that. What you're looking at is the formation of a liquid crystal. And basically this phage is taking a polymer that's present in human wound fluid and sputum, uh, and it's organizing it into a liquid crystal. And I would argue uh, that biofilms made by Pseudomonas, but then also E. coli and Klebsiella and many other bugs that colonize these different surfaces and cause infections, that these biofilms are tenacious, um, ultimately for the same reason that a diamond is forever. That is to say that they have this incredibly favorable state of entropy that ends up being very difficult to disrupt. Um, and rather than being slimy nests of polymers and you know, sort of the image of a you know, hairball at the bottom of your, your shower drain or something, um, those biofilms actually have higher order structure and I think actually are kind of elegant and even beautiful. So what? Well, um, you know, uh, that's kind of interesting and pretty, but uh, what can we do with it and does it matter? 
And so to look at this, we took PAO1. This is that you know sort of domesticated strain of Pseudomonas that we do a lot of our studies on. Um, and we deleted this phage from it. And we call that the PAO1 delta strain. And what you're looking at here is we grew these two different bacteria on filter paper. That's what these sort of holes are. And you can see that if you can make this phage, you make much more robust biofilms. And then we did these adhesion assays where you essentially take a flow chamber and you crank up the volume of flow and you look to see how long the bacteria can hold on to the walls. Um, and what we see when we do this, that in the absence of PF4 being spiked in, in the absence of phage, the bacteria let go pretty quickly. Um, but if we add in phage, they hold on longer. And that's the case for strains of bacteria that lack this phage. And it's also the case for strains of Pseudomonas that can't be infected with this phage either. The other thing is that this phage allows Pseudomonas to keep out antibiotics. So I mentioned that small colony variants are versions of Pseudomonas that make robust biofilms. Rough colony variants do not. And we find, um, as you might expect, that small colony variants do a really good job of keeping out this antibiotic called tobermycin. So that's up here. It takes a lot more tobermycin to kill bacteria um, if it's a small colony variant than a rough colony variant. If we take the strain of Pseudomonas that lacks this phage, this delta strain, um, we find that it looks for all the world like a rough colony variant. But if we spike back in the phage, now it starts to behave like a small colony variant. Um, and that is to say that the uh, presence of the phage is necessary and sufficient to uh, make these things keep antibiotics out. And what this actually looks like is, is this. So um, these phages form structures around bacteria. And if you take fluorescently labeled antibiotics and add those in, the labeled antibiotics get stuck in the uh, sort of matrix of that biofilm. Um, this is work by another lab um, uh, at Oxford. And what they did is they imaged uh, these things that I just showed you a moment ago. Uh, the red here is Pseudomonas. And what it's done is essentially build itself a house out of this virus, right? So this is kind of crazy. I'm, I'm telling you that a bacteria makes a bunch of viruses and then uses it as a structural assembly and it effectively lives in it to keep antibiotics um, and maybe even other lytic phages out. Um, and I like this shot here. This is kind of what that looks like. You've got the bacteria and then it's surrounded almost like an M&M &M is has got a candy shell um, of this crystalline layer of bacteria phages that wraps around and protects it. And so we developed an assay to quantify this because until you can measure stuff, what do you what do you really have? Where we took filter paper uh, and took our phages and our polymers and allowed them to make a liquid crystal and then added antibiotics and then measured what came across by looking to see how well it kills an unrelated bacteria called E. coli. And what we found is that some antibiotics, um, specifically as Trianam, Amikacin, and Meropenem, are trapped uh, by the presence of this phage, whereas other antibiotics kind of sail through. And what we've been working on is, is figuring out sort of what the molecular basis of that is. And we basically find that it varies with the size and the charge of the antibiotics in question. Um, but does this matter clinically? And so to look at this, I mentioned cystic fibrosis earlier. It's this genetic disease where uh, individuals have a mutated chloride channel. Um, and so their sputum ends up being thick and gnarly. Here's a picture of it um, to help you imagine what that looks like. And over time, these individuals uh, have declining lung function. And um, that may sound abstract, but the way that we actually measure this is we look to see how much air they can breathe out in one minute. And I'm going to show you, you know, sometimes these folks get down to 10% of what normal should be. And you can imagine why that's just a, a terrible way to live. Um, and a lot of that's due to chronic pseudomonas infections that cause these big goopy biofilms made out of sputum um, and then ultimately lead to difficulty breathing. And we can't get rid of that pseudomonas in many of these contexts because of all the antibiotic resistance. And so patients with CF um, uh, and uh, pseudomonas in their sputum, if they're infected with a strain that makes this phage, um, they can have as many as 10 to the 8 copies of this phage alone per ml, right? So an ml is about a thimbleful or so of water or of sputum, and 10 to the 8 is just a lot. And so essentially their sputum is, is just dominated by this phage if they, if they make it. Whereas if they don't have uh, this phage, it's, it's negative. And actually sputum from these individuals is crystalline. So if we take a sample of sputum from somebody with cystic fibrosis who makes this phage, their sputum is, is birefringent. And what we did to analyze this, uh, whereas if they don't have this phage, it's, it's not. 
So to attach numbers on this, uh, because again, you want to measure everything you can, um, we uh, essentially wrote a piece of software, uh, and then you can quantify the amount of biofringence and express it as sine delta. And if you take folks who are have CF and are infected with uh, Pseudomonas and make this phage, their sputum is fairly crystalline. Um, if, on the other hand, uh, they have Pseudomonas that doesn't have this phage, um, it's much less crystalline until you spike back in the phage, in which case it becomes a liquid crystal. So again, this phage is necessary and sufficient to organize the sputum of these individuals into a liquid crystal. And then to look to see if this changes clinical outcomes of people with Pseudomonas, um, we partnered with Carlos Mila, who runs the Cystic Fibrosis Clinic at Stanford, um, and Liz Bergener, who's a fellow who divides her time in our lab. And we collected sputum from different uh, patients with CF and looked to see if they had pseudomonas in this phage and what this did to their pulmonary function. And what we found is in a cohort of 58 patients that were followed at Stanford, um, about a bit more than one third of them, uh, so 36%, were infected with strains of pseudomonas that made this phage. And when we looked at two other cohorts, a Danish cohort of uh, just under 500 patients, or the Pseudomonas Genome Database that has over 2,000 Pseudomonas genomes. In all of these cases, we found that somewhere between 35 and 50% of these cases were infected with strains that made this phage. Um, and, you know, what's sort of impressive about that is in little kids with cystic fibrosis who um, uh, have been colonized with Pseudomonas, um, this phage is actually pretty rare, but by the time these kids get to be adults, it's like 50-50, and by the time they need a transplant, uh, that is to say a lung transplant, 100% of those really sick patients uh, are infected with strains of Pseudomonas that make this phage. So this phage starts to look like, number one, a bad actor, but then number two, it seems like there's a selective advantage behind strains that make this phage uh, that causes patients to acquire this over time. Um, those patients also uh, test positive for something called LEADS criteria, which is how we decide if uh, patients have chronic pseudomonas infection. If you're infected with PF, you meet those criteria more often than if you're infected with strains of pseudomonas that don't have PF. But if you have cystic fibrosis, this is probably the chart you, you actually really care about. Um, this is that pulmonary lung function test that I mentioned to you. So 100% predicted is hopefully what you all have um, in the audience tonight. Um, but if you take each of these dots uh, is a person with CF, and if you sort of look to see how much air they can breathe in one minute, um, and you scale that across how old these patients are, you'll notice that that um, uh, since about 40 years ago, when we got much better with giving out antibiotics, there are more dots here. That's because before that, um, patients, quite frankly, didn't survive into adulthood with this disease. But now there are all these patients that are living into adulthood. But if they're infected with strains of Pseudomonas that make this phage, their pulmonary function here in the blue line tends to decline more precipitously than if they're infected with strains of Pseudomonas that are negative for this phage. And again, what this sort of hammers home is that this phage is causing disease um, or worse disease in these patients. And this chart that you're looking at is, is kind of interesting because to my knowledge, it's actually the first real data uh, that I can point to uh, that indicates that um, a bacteriophage is actually directly causing a disease or contributing disease uh, in human subjects. Um, we also looked at patients in these different cohorts to see uh, whether they were more likely to acquire PF phage over time. Each of these numbers is a, an individual and um, got to figure out how to show these statistics, but essentially, yes. Um, patients will acquire PF phage over time, uh, consistent with the data I showed you earlier with the different cohorts of, of patients' ages. Um, the other thing we looked at is whether the strains of PF uh, of pseudomonas that carry this phage are more likely to be antibiotic resistant. And what we actually found was that, uh, in fact, that is the case. And the same bacteria um, that are associated with worse antibiotic um, sequestration in that assay I showed you are exactly the same ones that uh, these patients are more likely to develop resistance to. And so that's a compelling piece of evidence um, that this phage is actually driving antibiotic resistance in addition to disease in these folks. And so putting all this together as a model, uh, I would offer the following. If you take a patient with cystic fibrosis, or for that matter, you know, pneumonia of any kind, um, and you give them, uh, and they're infected with pseudomonas here in green, 
and you give them aerosolized antibiotics, those antibiotics penetrate mucus and kill the bacteria represented here as kind of hollow um, uh, shapes. On the other hand, if they're infected with a strain of Pseudomonas that makes this, this phage, just like those bacteria that were surrounded by that shield of viral particles, now these biofilms are protected. The aerosolized antibiotics can't get through uh, and disease progresses over time uh, and causes fibrosis and shortness of breath uh, and you know, ultimately can make these individuals quite sick. And so the conclusions I would offer uh, from this part of the talk uh, is that Pseudomonas partners uh, with these filamentous phages to build biofilms, that these uh, phages contribute to the pathogenic features of Pseudomonas in this context, uh, and that these phages are associated with antibiotic resistance um, in this disease. Um, I don't have time to show you this, but we've also published similar stories now in other diseases, um, specifically wound infections, where the same phage, um, if you're infected with the strain of Pseudomonas um, that uh, uh, cannot make this phage, chronic wounds in our clinic last on an average of half a year. Um, if you're infected with strains of Pseudomonas that do make this phage, those wounds on average last over two years. And we just published that about six months ago uh, in a journal called Cell Reports. Um, but the point is that stepping back, you've got both lung infections and cystic fibrosis and then diabetic wound infections. And in both of these contexts, PFH contributes to antibiotic resistance and the chronicity of disease. And so unlike the lytic phages that we spent time talking about earlier uh, that you can actually use to attack um, bacteria, these are phages that bacteria produce to uh, essentially improve their, their fitness um, and their, their virulence and to cause disease. So, you know, really two opposite sides of a, of a viral coin, if you will. So what are we gonna do about this? Uh, again, I'm at a medical school, and so our mission is to figure out how disease works and then try to treat it. Um, and so one of the fellows in my lab, uh, Christian DeVries, um, was interested in potentially developing a vaccine that would target these phages to see if we couldn't keep um, this phage from causing uh, worse colonization and, and disease. And so what Christian noticed was that if you look at the coat protein, uh, of this phage. And so just like, uh, say, for example, you know, COVID virus, where you have this spike protein or other coat proteins um, that have been targeted immunologically, we can target the coat proteins of these filamentous phages in the same way. And what Christian saw is that the coat proteins are actually quite conserved. Um, and again, these are what confer that intense negative charge that allows these phages to make biofilms. And so he generated a vaccine where what he did was immunize mice against this coat protein called CoAB, along with an adjuvant, and then came in a month later after boosting them and introduced infection into their wounds. And then he looked after three days to see how many of the mice were still infected. And what he found was, you know, he had titrated the, the dose of this antibiotic that causes infection so that exactly half the mice or 60% of the mice got infected. But if they were immunized, that fell to 20%. And this worked even better if we made monoclonal antibodies against uh, this phage. In other words, you could put in antibodies against this phage into the wounded mice instead of immunizing them. Um, and you essentially took the infections down to almost zero. And so what this says is that we need to improve our vaccines, um, but it also speaks to the potential of potentially taking individuals, uh, let's say when your grandmother develops diabetes before she gets pseudomonas wound infections, or let's say the cystic fibrosis patient who first gets diagnosed with CF, and we can potentially immunize them before they get infected with pseudomonas, before the stage shows up to keep them from being colonized. Alternatively, it may be possible to take antibodies like this um, and take your burn patient um, and treat him with antibodies before uh, he develops the chronic infection of those um, wounds that ultimately causes such problems in, in those patients. And I won't go through all of this data, but this is to show um, what we think is kind of going on mechanistically. And um, just to focus on this bit here at the bottom, the reason why we don't have vaccines against Pseudomonas now is that Pseudomonas is surrounded by these goopy polymers, sort of like a mini version of that biofilm. And essentially antibodies don't stick very well to polysaccharides because they're slimy and sugary. Um, they wanna stick, antibodies wanna stick to protein. 
And so what we see, I mentioned that these phages essentially make a shell around the bacteria that produce them. And our model is that what's actually going on here is that because the phages are stuck to the surface of the bacteria, that becomes a shell that allows the antibodies to adhere and get purchase. And this allows phagocytosis and potentially clearance of these infections. And in support of that, our antibodies only cause internalization and obstinization if in fact it's a strain of Pseudomonas that makes this phage. It doesn't work against the Delta strain that's negative. The other thing that these antibodies do, each of these, uh, we made five monoclonal antibodies. One of them didn't work. Uh, so you can see four that light up here in green. And the four that light up in green, if we pre-add them to cultures of this bacteria, that's what you're seeing growing here on a Petri dish with antibiotics, the antibodies, if they're present, essentially bust open uh, the colonies and allow the antibiotics to get through and kill the bacteria, uh, unless it's an antibody that doesn't work, in which case nothing happens um, in our control. And this is kind of exciting because it suggests that in addition to the antibodies targeting the immunology of these infections, that there may actually be a role for also disrupting these crystalline networks. And so the conclusions I would draw from this part of the talk are that vaccines targeting PFH may protect against Pseudomonas, um, and that these phages are a novel front in the fight against Pseudomonas aeruginosa infections, um, and that these temperate filamentous phages, these lysogenic phages, may have important roles in human health and disease. And I would offer that this is, a, again, a, a different model rather than phages being sort of the enemy of our enemy and therefore something we can harness to use to treat infections. I'm proposing that these phages can actually cause disease in you and I. So to tie all this whole talk up in a bow um, uh, and to bring together the two parts of, of this talk, um, I would offer that phages contribute to health and disease in multiple ways. You have lytic phages here in sort of this orangey arrow um, that actually can help us treat bacterial infections um, and maybe help us lead you know, longer infection-free lives. But on the other hand, we actually have phages that are produced by bacteria, lysogenic phages, that can actually contribute to things like chronic infections and antibiotic resistance. And if, again, that seems like it's very complicated, I would remind you um, that you know, our bodies are full of bacteria and fungi and uh, other microorganisms where we have similar uh, ambiguities. The other thing that I would point out is that phages are fundamentally parasites. And I would offer you this sort of parting thought. Um, one of the things that parasites do uh, is they can infect multiple hosts, right? And so this is an example of schistosomiasis, which is a type of infection that lives in people. Uh, but it also lives in snails. And what happens is, is it causes chronic infections with people who um, use the toilet and let eggs from uh, these parasites into the water. Uh, that infects snails. And then we either ingest the snails or ingest the water with these early life forms. And that leads to this complex life cycle that unites us with snails and this parasite. Similar things happen with toxoplasmosis. If anybody's ever wondered why you have to get rid of the cat kitty litter uh, when a, a woman is pregnant, it's because you don't want her or her unborn child getting infected with this parasite that can infect both us and cats. There's a lot of organisms that are like this. And since phages are fundamentally parasites, what if phages actually work um, exactly like schistosomiasis or toxo does, where in a way you have multiple stages of these life cycles where it's infecting both the bacteria, but also us um, and promoting long-term infections. Um, that isn't incompatible with us using lytic phages for phage therapy. But I guess the point I'm trying to make is there's some you know, amazingly interesting biology. And I like to think that maybe some of the other phages in our body are potentially causing other diseases, things like diabetes and hypertension, um, in addition to uh, chronic infections, and that there's this whole world of microorganisms and bacteriophages in particular uh, in our bodies uh, that we've only begun to explore. And that's a big part of what my lab is trying to do. Uh, and I think these are fun topics that we'll hopefully learn more about in the future. Um, and so to tie all this up in a bow, I'd like to acknowledge the people that actually did this work on this slide. Um, and uh, essentially, these are the people in my lab, notably Liz Bergener, who I told you about, and Yolene Swear, 
uh, did a lot of the initial studies uh, that I mentioned. Um, we partner with Gina Sa at the Mayo Clinic um, and do a lot of phage therapy work with her. Uh, Sandeep and his group at Texas Children's um, have been doing a lot of the wound healing work, Chandan Sen uh, as well. And then these are our collaborators at Stanford um, who we work with. Pat Secor is the guy that first introduced me to phages and really got a lot of this work started. And so with that, um, I think we're just about uh, on time. And so with that, I'll uh, stop and take any questions. All right. Let's get the question started. So I think there is a Q&A button at the bottom. So if you guys do want to ask questions, go ahead and click on that and you can type it in and we'll address it throughout the rest of this session. So I see already a couple have come through. So one from Jim here says, how were phages obtained, handled, and applied when they were first applied medically in the early 20th century? Yeah. And so essentially what they would have done uh, in some ways is actually not all that different from what we do. Um, that is to say that they would grow up um, cultures of bacteria and then take a phage that they saw had made a lytic plaque and inoculate that into the culture of bacteria and essentially grow up a lot more phages. And then what they would do is filter those. Um, and in general, uh, it's remarkable how relatively uninflammatory uh, that mix was. You could actually take that and inject it into people. And there's a lot of bacterial crud there, but it actually does seem like phages seem to dampen inflammation associated with bacterial pathogens. Um, what we do now is really similar to what he did, what Darrell did, except the difference is we use um, biochemistry to essentially take out all of the bacterial crud. Um, and we do a much better job of getting it uh, what's called endotoxin free. So the FDA limits how much bacterial product can be present in any drug. And so we have to get the phages, just like other drugs, to the point where they have almost none. Um, and so we've gotten a bunch better. Um, really, the heart of what we do, you know, Harrell would have recognized. That's great. Thanks for that. We have a couple more already coming in. It says, can phages be a cause of intestinal health problems? We have heard recently of the need to have a healthy microbiome in our intestines. Some people have intestinal issues. Could some of these be caused by bacteria phages attacking the necessary bacteria in our microbiome? Yeah, um, great question. And the short answer is yes. So if you've ever heard of um, uh, cholera, uh, you'll know that cholera causes this terrible diarrheal disease because it makes something called cholera toxin. And what cholera toxin does is it gets into the cells that line your intestines and quite frankly kills them. And cholera toxin is actually born on a very similar filamentous phage to the one that I've just described. Um, so essentially this filamentous phage lives in cholera and it encodes this toxin. And so, you know, again, this world of ambiguities, you know, is it the phage making the toxin or is it the bacteria making the toxin? Um, it isn't clear to me, uh, but what is clear is that it's an example of a, of a bacteria phage in some people's guts that actually causes disease. There's other ways that phages can cause disease too. Um, and you know, we're again, only beginning to explore that. On the other hand, phages will embed themselves in the mucus that lines your intestine and protect you. Lytic phages will protect you from invasion uh, by some types of, of bacteria that would otherwise want to get from the inside of your gut into the inside of you. Um, and so from that perspective, they're, they're protective. So I would offer that phages do both things. They can cause diarrheal diseases, but they can also protect you as well from diarrheal diseases. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I think there's another question along the lines of that. It says, if we want to harness phages for treatment, can we learn from the pharmaceutical companies using AAVs for delivering gene therapy? They seem to be able to manage the viruses pretty well. Yeah. And so um, this is a question about adenovirus vectors. Um, and so the adenoviruses are what we use currently for gene therapy. Um, and, you know, it's it's interesting because not too long ago, uh, for those who, you know, are, are maybe my age or a little less than that, I suppose, um, might remember that, you know, there were, there's at least one death that I know of um, with adenovirus therapy um, at the University of Pennsylvania. And, you know, in other words, there's, and I, I think still there's a lot of concerns about the safety of any of these approaches. Um, we've gotten a lot better. Um, 
but you know it really took a lot of genetic engineering and the ability to you know generate adenoviruses and relatively safe vectors and you purify preparations for that to work and maybe to answer the question um i'm pretty hopeful that we can do some similar things with bacteriophages yeah and that's that's interesting another another attendee said are there commercial ventures already looking at phages for potential treatment yeah so there's um you know, on probably a couple dozen at this point, companies in the U.S. that are trying different strategies for harnessing bacteriophages as therapies for infectious diseases. Um, probably the best funded one is a company called APT that's based in Maryland. Um, but there are other ones, uh, including some local companies. Um, the one we partner with is called Felix, and they're based in South San Francisco. Yeah, I imagine here in the in the Silicon Valley, there would be some ventures that would maybe be interested. I think uh, uh, branching off there, it says another question here says, are there physical methods to disrupt liquid crystals? Yeah, so um, we can do a handful of different things uh, that that are kind of interesting in this regards. Um, the antibodies that I showed you really only work if you can deliver them before they form. Once you actually have these structures, uh, you know, the antibodies aren't going to do anything. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing uh, with the antibodies that's a limitation is the stoichiometry is all wrong. Um, and by that, I mean, each phage can soak up a few thousand antibodies, we think. And so, you know, you can only get titers that are so high. The strategy works in a mouse that hasn't been infected yet. Um, because when it's initially infected, there really aren't very many bacteria or phages that are there, so it works. But once you actually have a biofilm, the, the antibodies really are, aren't going to change anything. On the other hand, we can make antimicrobial peptides uh, that do a much better job. The, the other thing that's sort of fun is you can actually, because of these phages and the way they work through charge-based interactions, um, we can actually put uh, magnetic fields around these biofilms and then that seems to do some interesting things with affecting the permeability. And what's interesting about that, oh, and then we can also take um, multivalent cations um, and use them to swap out for the mon monovalent cations. And that seems to change the way these crystals work and change them more into gels. And those, um, you know, it, what's funny about that is these different strategies. Uh, there's actually a number of different companies that are trying to develop um, electrical fields as therapy for chronic biofilm infections. They have no idea how that works, um, but it may work by disrupting these crystalline biofilms. And mm -hmm. similarly, in CF, um, lung infections, um, you know, uh, we essentially take uh, water, um, so saline, and we do these rinses, um, or we take DNAs. Uh, which chop up the DNA in the lung and make them into little fragments. And each of these things would be predicted, or at least experimentally we've shown, uh, would do a good job at disrupting these networks. And so essentially we've hit empirically on a number of different strategies that do exactly what the uh, the, the uh, attendee is, is asking. Um, they you know have ways of disrupting these structures. Um, of course, some of these things are more practical than others, and you know, electrical fields and all of that are pretty experimental. Um, sure. But again, I, I think there's some potential for getting this to work, but it just really helps if you know what's going on. Yeah, no, thanks for that answer. Uh, another question here says, is there a way to engineer a lysogenic phage to cross over into the lytic cycle in response to a controllable external stimulus or an internal stimulus such as bacterial population? That's a terrific question. And um, a lot of the companies that are, so it turns out that the number of phages out there that are purely lytic is actually pretty low. Um, most of the phages that are around uh, tend to be lysogenic. And so what a lot of the investigators do uh, is they will take uh, um, lysogenic phages and then try to genetically manipulate them and turn them into lytic phages. And you can do that typically by getting rid of some of the genes that mediate lysogeny. Great. Yeah, no, that's um, another question here says, could phages be engineered to help against cancer? Thank you very much for the talk. Yeah, so we've got some grants to do exactly that. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, the potential of modifying these things and getting them, uh, using them in contexts where adenovirus vectors can't be used, I think, um, is something really exciting. That's great. Um, another question here says, what are the prospects for mass producing phages for therapy, or are we limited to treating one patient at a time, which would be very expensive? 
Yeah. And so what Felix, uh, this company in South San Francisco has been doing is trying to, rather than doing this artisanal sort of bespoke thing where everybody gets their own phage therapy, um, they've been trying to develop cocktails where if you take a handful of different phages that together uh, cover a number of different bacterial pathogens, maybe, just maybe, you've got an off-the-counter product uh, that you can actually prescribe and then, you know, potentially get IP around and own. Um, and so that cocktail uh, is in clinical trials in a couple of different spots. And hopefully we'll hear some good things in the next little bit. That's great. And another question, actually, along those lines a bit it says, do you anticipate a scenario where phage therapy becomes the new form of antibiotics that lead to consequences such as an evolutionary adaptation that allows bacteriophages to infect our own cells, or one that allows bacteria to become resistant to both phages and antibiotics simultaneously? Yeah. So what I would say is um, that uh, even if phages could get into our cells, and I think there's some data around that, um, they can't replicate. And so, you know, in general, uh, the problem with viral infections, of course, is that they not only uh, get into our cells, but they will replicate and, and kill ourselves. And so, you know, it would take a, a pretty broad evolutionary jump for, for bacteriophages to be able to replicate inside of a eukaryotic cell um, that's just made so differently from a prokaryotic cell. Um, but that being said, I think you can bet on antimicrobial resistance in any context. And so in the same way that, you know, uh, antibiotic resistance to penicillins showed up, I think within a few months of penicillins coming out, um, I think you can pretty much bet that phages, uh, that you would have resistance to phages too. Mm -hmm. The distinction though, is the millions and millions of years of evolutionary history. Like I, I can, and we do go down to the Palo Alto sewage treatment plant um, and harvest phages. And because of the fact that, you know, bacteria and bacteriophages have been duking it out doing war for so many different years, um, essentially I can continue to find um, uh, bacteriophages that are going to be efficacious um, for a lot longer than, uh, and with a lot less effort than would be involved in identifying, um, you know, analogous uh, pharmaceutical antibiotics, which, you know, I don't, uh, I mean, it's been years since a totally new class came along, for example. Mm -hmm. That's great. I, another question here says, what what have you learned from the P, PF phage genome? Do you see the phage genome integrated in the bacteria in the lytic system? Yeah. And so the phage genome, what's interesting um, in the environment, uh, it's, you know, not uh, it could be 10% of clinical isolates have this phage, but it seems like in humans, there are some really strong selective pressures, probably antibiotics um, that allow this to kind of come into being. And when these uh, bacteria are infected with these lytic phages, or sorry, these um, filamentous phages, um, not unlike maybe parasitic wasps and caterpillars or something, um, the phages totally rewire the behavior of the bacterium and so it does things that that favor the phage. It, for one thing, makes just a ton of phage. Um, but then other parts of bacterial physiology, things like quorum sensing, if you know what that is, um, are completely changed by this, this phage being around. Um, and so it seems like the bacteria, uh, the strains that make this phage are highly adapted to having it around um, and are just a, a bit almost of a different you know, organism, I, I would almost say, uh, even though they're the same species. Wow, that's... Amazing. Um, another question here says, how do the specializations of phages that pathog path pathogenize gram-negative bacteria compare to those that infect gram-positive bacteria? Yeah. And so, you know, it's a little bit um, different. Uh, the, the I'm trying to think what's a good way of, of, of explaining the, the difference, but essentially gram-negative bugs have an awful lot more phages and tend to have slimy biofilms and all these other adaptations um, to living in an environment like the gut. Um, you do have some gram positives in the gut, um, but they tend to be anaerobes and other things. The gram negatives um, also swap their DNA a whole bunch more, maybe actually in defense against phages. Um, but gram positives, like the ones that live on your skin, um, they tend to have fewer phages uh, and, you know, it's just, it's a little bit of a different environment. I would almost say it's like the difference between, 
you know, someone who lives in the city and someone who lives out in the country. And to put a fine point on that, um, you know, there are stories of soldiers in World War I or the Civil War where all the soldiers from the countryside who came and, and fought the Civil War or came and fought in World War I ended up getting sick from different infections that the city kids just didn't get because they were just exposed to a lot more. And I, I think the gram negatives that are in your gut and in other environments similarly um, just have a lot more immune defenses against bacteriophages and all of this. And, you know, most of the, you know, big antibiotic resistant organisms that you can think of, you know, Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, things like that tend to be the gram negatives, um, you know, with some exceptions, but mostly. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, so so the gram negatives, uh, phage therapy, you know, it's useful mostly, I think, for things like mycobacteria or gram negatives, um, and then other bugs that are uh, either really difficult to treat with antibiotics at all, or where we just have a lot of antibiotic resistance. Mm. That's great. Um, all right, we're going to wrap up here with a couple more questions, and I'll let you go. I know it's it's late, so we'll we'll wrap this up with these last few questions. So. Uh, interesting question here. It says, could we see phage-based liquid crystal displays in computer screens in the future? Um, I love that idea. Um, and I think there's a lot of potential applications in bioengineering. Um, we, uh, If we had more time, I could tell you about some sunscreens and things that we've been looking at. Um, but, but basically, uh, I think there are industrial applications. There's a group at MIT that's taken filamentous phages like this one and you know, conjugated them to uh, lithium and is basically making, uh, taking crystalline networks like these and organizing them into effectively battery capacitors. Um, there are also other groups that have used, um, uh, I think independent of us, uh, have been using filamentous phages like these together with polymers to make uh, coatings and different gels. So I, I do think that the biotechnology world has kind of figured out that these principles of self-assembly uh, that are almost infinitely scalable um, are kind of powerful. I don't know about TV screens, but I like the idea a lot. Yeah, no, that would be super interesting. Another question here, do only lysogenic phages exhibit the biofilm enhancing behavior? And then second question says, do all lysogenic phages exhibit the biofilm enhancing behavior? No, these filamentous phages are a very small subset of the um, phages that are out there. And I think most of the bacteria uh, don't do this. This is a very particular thing to these guys. I think other lysogenic phages probably do other interesting things, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the immune system, for example, um, but they're not making crystalline biofilms. Interesting. And uh, another question here, and we're, we'll wrap up with this last, last two. It says, given their sheer numbers and presence almost everywhere, would you say that most biofilms are the result of phages or are at least enhanced by the presence of phages? Um, no, I, I think that it's basically gram negative bugs. Um, and then, you know, but, but most bacteria will make some kind of biofilm. And, you know, we don't find this filamentous phage, for example, in gram positives. Um, and I, I think, you know, bacteria are very diverse and incredibly ancient, and um, they've probably worked out on, um, they've worked out different ways of making biofilms. This is, I think, one of the more intriguing ones, uh, and maybe one of the more effective ones. But the, um, yeah, there's, there's, I think, different biology there. Yeah. And we'll wrap up with this last question. It says, how do we progressively look at phagocytes differently as Eli Mechnikoff did? Or how are we improving and developing new innovative ways to build natural immunity for underdeveloped countries? Is there a new technology to combat or replicate what pharmaceutical drugs do? Well, I think those are a, a bunch of different um, questions. Um, maybe to tackle the middle one first. Um, so improved innovative ways to build natural immunity for underdeveloped countries. I think one of the, the major efforts that's going on right now is to come up with different adjuvants. And you know, in the US until very recently, it was just alum, um, but there's a lot of uh, other um, uh, toll-like receptor-based adjuvants and things like this um, that in some ways are, are better for developing countries because they don't need um, a lot of the same storage and, and um, uh, preparation uh, constraints that that maybe some of our vaccine products do. Um, and that's not just around adjuvants, that's just the technology. 
Um, and I think, you know, in terms of bringing health to the developing world, um, those approaches, uh, you know, it's not quite natural immunity, um, but primed immunity, I think, um, has shown to be really of benefit in a lot of different infections. And I think that's where uh, most of the progress and enthusiasm are currently. Great. Well, I think we'll wrap up here then. I know it's getting late. So thank you everyone for tuning in today. And thank you so much, doc Dr. Boyke, take, uh, for taking the time to speak with us tonight. I think uh, based on all these questions we had, everyone thought it was super interesting. And uh, I love hearing about this stuff. This is just great that we were able to put this on tonight. And for our audience members, our next Cafe Sci will be coming up in March. So be on the lookout for that in our inbox. And with that, I'll hand it over to Armand, our Cafe Sci lead, to close out the session. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Boyke, for such an engaging presentation. It was a pleasure to have you with us today. Of course. Thanks for inviting me. The pleasure is all ours. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight.